Hey y'all, this is Auntie Flax, and this is part two of my glute series. Um, for this one in particular, I'm gonna go over the compound lifts that I did right after activation. So if you watched the first one, I went over the activation exercises I did. And then for this one, I'm gonna go over the exact compound lifts I did. And for the last video, I kind of rambled a little bit before getting to the actual exercises and had a lot of good feedback on, you know, maybe they wanted to see that first. So for this one, I'm gonna do the actual compound lifts I did and then dive into why I only did those two um, in particular, the hip thrust and the deadlift. All right, so let's dive right into this. Um, right after those activation exercises, I go straight into the hip thrusts and then the deadlifts. Okay, so for the hip thrust, I'm actually gonna go over like exactly what I do, because I think I do my reps um, and sets a little bit differently than other people, and then I'll go into really the mistakes that I made, because hip thrusts were super intimidating me when I first started, and I think I made pretty much every single mistake out there, um, and what I learned works best in terms of form. So for the hip thrust, um, as I mentioned in my previous video, I actually don't put a number of reps. Um, and again, that's just because if I do, I will stop at that even if it doesn't burn. So for me, I do as many reps as I can. And then once I start fatiguing out, I notice that it is much easier for me to hold it at the top, right? When you're squeezing your glutes to hold the bar up, then go for another rep. And this is really for two reasons. Um, one, it's a psychological thing for me. If I'm already feeling pretty fatigued out and I'm tired, right? If I go for another full rep, I notice that as the bar gets closer to the ground, I kind of convince myself that I can stop. So I'll just let the bar kind of sit and fall and then don't do the another rep. So one, it's like a psychological thing for me. Um, but two, I also notice that as you're going for another rep, because these are compounded movements, right? And all these other muscles are getting engaged. And again, I'm fatigued out. I have a little bit of energy left. It is easier for me to squeeze at the top using pretty much mostly my glutes versus going for a full rep and engaging all my other muscles as well. I personally try to hold it for five, six seconds, um, but if I can go longer, of course, I'm gonna wanna hold it longer. And then once those five, six seconds are up, then I actually go for a pulse. And this part is brutal, right? I mean, you really gotta force yourself to do it. But again, I notice that if I go for a full rep, I'll give up, which is why I do the pulse. And I almost always try to do three pulses. So just to summarize that again, I do as many reps as I can until it really starts to hurt, till I'm starting to fatigue. And then instead of going for another rep, I like to hold it at the top and squeeze, hold my glutes as long as I can. Again, usually five to six seconds. And then once I'm really, really fatigued out, I force three pulses. So once I complete that full set, what I actually like to do is have minimal rest in between my sets. And it's just a personal thing that I've noticed. If I sit there too long um, and let time pass, then I notice one, I can feel my glutes not burning as much. And two, it's a psychological thing for me. If I sit there for too long, I can convince myself to stop entirely. So instead, what I like to do is go for another set almost immediately. And when I say that, I know that's kind of a vague term. I think I maybe rest 10 to 15 seconds at maximum, um, which is really, again, the whole point is I want my glutes to still be burning by the time I go into the next set. And one big thing that I've noticed is that when I'm really engaging my glutes and I'm really putting in that maximum effort, I can actually feel my glutes really burning when I sit down, when I'm resting, right? That 10 to 15 seconds in between, I can really, really feel my glutes. And I noticed, you know, sometimes you just don't have as good of a set, you know, sometimes you're not, your mind's not into it, you maybe gave up. Um, and I think that's a really good cue, firstly, for me to know if I'm putting the maximum effort in. Now, in terms of how many sets I do, I actually do about six to eight. Um, and I know that is quite a lot. I think a lot of other people do usually the basic four, right? Um, but again, the reason why I can do six or eight sets is because I'm really only focusing on two compounded lifts. So once I'm done with the six to eight sets of those hip thrusts, back to back, minimal rest in between, I immediately jump up and go right into donkey kickbacks and fire hydrants as burnouts. So the reason why that I choose fire hydrants and donkey kickbacks as my burnouts is because for me personally, like I really noticed that I think my upper and side glutes are a lot harder to grow um, and also engage in general. And I believe that's probably because it's a little bit smaller. Um, it also might be just in my head, I'm not quite sure. But for me, I really wanna grow those, right? Because that's what gives it 
that round, you know, that nice, like juicy round one that we all want. Um, so for me, like as they're already burning from the hip thrust and they're already pretty fatigued out, right? Those muscles are being torn. That's really where I want to take it a step further and do the burnouts for those side and upper glutes. And you'll notice that I don't, again, use any weights with these burnouts um, because for me, it's easier to burn out without any weights. Once you put weights on it, it kind of feels like an entirely new set versus a burnout. I feel like I did the opposite thing as the last video and I feel like I just like burned through that really quickly um, and it might be confusing. So I'm gonna put up exactly what I do right here in terms of the hip thrust written it out for y'all. Um, and I'll also put it down in the description too. So for hip thrusts in particular um, and deadlifts as well, really anything with the big barbell uh, bar, I was super intimidated. Um, and I think scared might be the better word. I was really terrified to start these things because, you know, one, the bar was 45 pounds and I could barely lift 45 pounds. Um, so just everything about it was really intimidating for me. And when I first started off, I think one of the biggest mistakes I made was really not taking care of the proper form. And then of course, right, again, your lower back starts hurting and then you convince yourself you don't have to work out because your lower back starts hurting. And it's kind of like this endless cycle. So here are just some common mistakes that I made personally. And then what I've learned is now the proper form to make sure my back doesn't hurt. So I think first and foremost, the biggest mistake that I made was thinking I can lift heavier than I can. Um, and I think it's because, you know, you always see these videos of other people, influencers, stuff like that. And they have, you know, the big 45 pound plates, like two of them on each side. And so you're like, okay, I want to do that. And so you go for it. Um, but again, you know, your glutes aren't big enough. Um, your muscles just aren't growing yet. And so you can't do it. So I want to reiterate that like when I started, um, again, I had no glutes. I could barely hip thrust 30 pounds. Um, I, it, it's kind of embarrassing to admit that out loud, but it's the truth, right? I could only lift 30 pounds at most. You know, eventually I worked my way up. Now I'm around 225, I would say. But even now, the one big thing I've noticed over and over again is if I try to say do 225 pounds every single time, my form is going to give out. It's just not good for my back, right? Because as strenuous as it gets, the first thing I personally let go is bracing my core. And I want to reiterate that really this isn't just for your glutes. I've noticed throughout my entire lifting journey that although I can lift, say, 100 pounds, just because it's easier to remember, even if I can lift 100 pounds, I've noticed that I kind of have this like sweet spot, so to say, um, where I can do my form more properly, get more efficient reps in at say 80 pounds than 100 pounds. And again, this just might be me and my personal preference, um, but I think that's not really talked about a lot because you always hear it lift as heavy as you can, right? Because that's how you grow the muscles. Um, but again, for me, if I was maxed out at say 100 and I try to do 100 because I want to lift heavy and people preach that to me, I've noticed my form gives out pretty easily. And then, you know, things start hurting, um, my glutes aren't engaged as much. And so I find that if I lower the weight just a little bit and, you know, maybe not lift so much with, I guess, my ego and my pride, um, then I can have much more efficient burn. So in terms of my footing, when I'm doing the hip thrust, it's the same concept as I talked about a little bit with the shoulder width apart. I make sure that I'm around a 90 degree angle, but then I move my feet around to find that exact spot where my heels dig into the most. Another thing that I struggled with when doing the hip thrust was everyone was like, put the bench under your shoulder blades. Um, and again, maybe I'm just not good at anatomy, but I was like, I don't know where my shoulder blades are. Um, like, is it down here? Like, is it up here? I, I just, I don't know. And from what I've learned is I was going way too low. So I would put the bench like, you can't really see if I, once I go up, but like down here, um, I don't know why I thought my shoulder blades ended down there, um, but I did. And I noticed when I would do stuff like that, my back, I guess my spine couldn't neutrally um, go up and down. And so I would really, I guess, kind of curve it. Um, and that would hurt my back really bad. And from trial and error and looking up proper human anatomy, I've learned that your shoulder blade, and I wonder if you can see it, you can kind of see it if I like go like that, is actually right here, um, which for me is a lot higher than I thought. 
And I think maybe that might be something that, again, I just struggled with, but in case someone else struggled with that, um, your shoulder blades, you can actually see it in the lighting, right? It's right there. So another thing that I really struggled with was bracing my core. Um, and again, like this might come as an obvious thing to other people, but this was just something that I struggled with. Um, when people were saying brace your core, one, I'm not gonna lie guys, I really, I really didn't take that seriously. Um, and you know, now going through this for a couple of months, I realized how important it is to brace your core. But at the time I just, you know, I thought it was just like an extra step that I didn't have to do. Um, but for me, bracing your core is again, taping deep breath in and then you're flexing your abs. And the way that I like to think about it is it's as if someone is going to punch you in your stomach. Um, I know that sounds weird, but remember when you were like in grade school or whatever, and there was a, I don't know, cute guy or something. And they were like, punch my abs. Um, I hope that was a thing for other people or else this is really embarrassing. But um, that's exactly what I think about, right? So taking a deep breath in and then flexing my abs as if someone's going to punch it. So one thing that I noticed using bands in a hip thrust is that when I was first starting out, I thought a higher resistant band meant more of a workout, right? Um, that was my correlation that I made in my head. And so I used a really heavy resistant band when I was doing hip thrusts. And one thing that I noticed when I do that is that because the resistance is so hard, it actually starts to cave my knees in a little bit. And then I feel it more in my quads and I have a harder time focusing on my glutes. So now if I do use a band, I use it really more for a physical cue to keep my knees out. Um, and again, these are way less resistance. So when I first started doing hip thrusts, I think probably the biggest mistake I made was how I did the movement. Um, you know, from watching other people's videos and stuff, I didn't understand that you are supposed to lift with your hip thrust versus your entire body. So you know how you see people go down into kind of that V-shape down to the floor and back up. And I mimic that exact movement using more of my legs and my back and all that good stuff. And what I've really learned is that it really truly is your hip thrusting. You really are lifting with your glutes. So the idea of lifting with your hips and thrusting up was really foreign to me. And I had a really hard time understanding that. And this is gonna sound really weird, um, but just bear with me, but think of a heterosexual relationship and think of the act of the birds and the bees. Um, but a guy isn't thrusting his entire body, right? The back and his legs aren't really involved. It's really just his hip and eggplant that's moving. And I know that sounds really weird as a way to think about it, but that's the best way that I did it. And I would actually practice this. I think I looked absolutely crazy, but I would actually practice this like on my couch without any weight. So I would get in the hip thrust position and then try to just lift with my hips and thrusting up. Um, and sometimes, especially when I'm fatigued out, I kind of let this form give out. I know I'm not supposed to, but I am just human. It's just what happens. Um, so it's kind of like this idea that, you know, maybe there's just like a little flame under just your glutes. And so you're lifting up just your glutes. I don't know if that was a good explanation. I'm really sorry if it wasn't. And then this is just a little small tip, but I have really long hair and I noticed if I put it in a ponytail, it gets caught in my shoulder blades against the bench and it pulls and it really hurts. So for my long haired ladies, buns are the way to go. And for the deadlift, it's the same exact concept of the hip thrust. So I'll do as many reps as I can until I'm fatigued out. And then once I'm fatigued out, I'll hold it at the very top, squeezing for dear life for about five to six seconds. And then I'll be done with one set. The reason why I don't pulse here or do another extra rep is because for me personally, I just, from a body proper form, you know, non-injury standpoint, I can't see a way to pulse on a deadlift. So I avoid that. And then just like the hip thrust, I'll do about six to eight sets of that. And then right afterwards, go right into the fire hydrants and donkey kicks again. So deadlifts were probably the most terrifying out of all the lifts for me. Um, you know, it just, it looked really intimidating to begin with. And then really the only people I've seen in my gym do it is men, uh, which like big men too. And it really freaked me out trying to do them at first. 
So let's go over the proper form for deadlifts real quick. Um, I think the biggest mistake that I made by far was looking down at the bar. Um, and again, I know that might sound silly to other people, but I was really paranoid about making sure my like footing and positioning was right um, and my hands were straight. So I would look down at them, um, which is a really, really big no-no because again, you're curving your neck really bad and your spine. So making sure that your head is up, you're looking up and it's always that straight line. Another thing that of course we wanna do is keep our arms straight, right? And keep our like shoulders tucked in. Um, I think this is one that I really, really struggle with. I don't know if it's because um, I'm just overthinking it or if I'm just using sometimes too hard of a weight, but I've noticed that my arms do kind of float away sometimes. So I had to start telling myself that there's glue under my armpits, that way I don't move them and then my arms keep straight as well. And of course, we're bracing our core the entire time because again, we don't want to hurt our back. And as we're lifting, you know, people always say to dig your heels in, right? When these compounded movements. Um, but I've noticed that for me, deadlifting, I think this is the one where I struggled with the most to dig my heels in. Um, and I guess the best way that I've learned to really do this is I kind of pretend like I'm, I know it sounds again weird, but like jumping off. You know, when you're jumping off, you're digging your heels in to push off of the ground. And that's really the movement that I tell myself. Instead of digging my heels in, I'm really thinking about pushing off, off the ground with my heels. Now, when I was first starting off, y'all, remembering all of that was really, really hard. Um, and quite honestly, a little bit intimidating. And I know this is gonna sound really weird, but this is exactly how I remembered it. Um, you guys remember that song, heads, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. I started making like a remix version of that and I would sing it to myself before every single deadlift. And it goes, heads, shoulders, knees and heels, knees and heels, breathe. And again, I know that sounds really silly, but it was just a really easy way for me to remember that my head has to stay up, my shoulders tucked in and my arms straight, my knees caved out a little bit, right pointed out, and my heels digging into the ground to push up and then breathe to brace my core. So heads, shoulders, knees and heels, knees and heels, breathe. That was really embarrassing. So I feel like now at this point, everyone's probably wondering like, where are the squats? Where are the Bulgarian uh, lunges? Like, is that really only what you do, those two lifts? And the answer is yes. And I actually think this is why I saw really quick results maybe compared to other people. Um, and I'll kind of explain the backside of why I do this because I think it's important for people to understand. So whenever I think about the gym, I think, okay, I'm walking into the gym and I have 100% energy level, right? I haven't done anything yet, I have 100%. I wanna spend that 100% energy level on lifts that will give me the most effective and quickest results, right? So think about, you wanna use your energy on lifts that are actually going to give you the most effective results. And I think this is just, you know, anything to do with life, right? I mean, if you think about like, if someone gave you two options, say you have $10, right? You have $10 and they give you option A or option B. If you put $10 that you have in option A, you're gonna get $20 back. But if you put it in B, you're gonna get $100 back. Um, I feel like this is a pretty no brainer, right? You're gonna wanna put it into option B. And that's really the same concept that I use in my head. And like, okay, I only have so much time in the day. I only have so much energy to give in the gym. So I really wanna use it on things that are gonna be the most effective, you know, work out my body the most and really work out those glutes. Now, without going into kind of like a long rant, I think in general, men do understand this a little bit better um, because, you know, their society does tell them that, right? They give them that simple equation of lift heavy, right? Doing compounded lifts that are effective, eat more. So protein carbs equals more muscles. It's a very simple equation that they're told. Um, and that's the equation that I think, you know, pretty much everyone will agree is what actually works. However, the issue becomes, I think for women, we aren't told that. And again, I'm not going to try to go on a rant here, but we as women are told, you know, do endless cardio, do all these activation exercises, minimal weights, you'll get bulky, um, you know, all these like green tea, losing uh, fat drinks and stuff. And the issue is, again, we're told this like jumble of an equation um, and none of it's true. 
And the issue is they're really just telling us that so we buy more products because society understands that women have this pressure to look better all the time. And so when people tell us stuff like that, we all fall for it, including me, like I've fallen for that, right? And it took me a really, really long time to understand that it really is, again, the equation, effective compounded lifts plus more foods or protein, carbs, your macros equals more muscle, right? And again, that's really what I'm trying to preach when I say like, when I go to the gym, I really only focus on those two compounded glute movements because again, they're the most effective and I wanna use my energy on the most effective. I also think it's worth noting that I've seen a lot of guys call certain exercises useless. Um, it's pretty popular on TikTok right now. And I think again, because they understand that there are more effective exercises, um, they're really trying to say that you should be doing these exercises because they'll give you results faster and more effectively. Um, but I think men are not good at communicating, which is why they use the word useless. And I don't like that word. Now, another reason why we focus on those two compounded lifts, other than the fact that they're the most effective, is this idea for me when I was first beginning, trying to perfect five, six, seven, eight different lifts seemed really daunting, right? I was like, I have to know the form. I have to remember my weights. Like it was just a lot for me. So the idea that I only had to perfect the form of two lifts that were the most effective just made the most logical sense to me. And to be quite honest with y'all, I think again, that's another reason why my glutes grew so quickly is because I was focusing on these really two most effective exercises. But on top of that, because I was doing it so much, right? So again, you'll notice that I do six to eight sets, which is usually a lot more than other people do. They usually do four sets. And I've noticed that because I got to do those over and over and over again, that I really learned what works for me and what the proper form was a lot quicker than someone trying to perfect five, six, or seven different exercises, right? Because truly, and I know, I feel like none of us really wanna talk about it, but the only way to truly learn is by doing. Um, and I know, again, I feel like none of us wanna admit that, but no matter how many like good tips and tricks I give y'all, until you actually go to the gym and put that into practice and start listening to your body, right? Doing it over and over again, starting to memorize what it feels like. That's really when you start learning. And I think, again, when you only have two lifts to focus on, you have more time, more reps, more sets to actually get the form right. And then because of it, you kind of learn quicker what actually works and what the proper form is. And the quicker you learn that, I think the quicker you can truly raise those weights. Another reason that I only do the two lifts is it's kind of psychological, to be quite honest with y'all. I've really learned that going to the gym is a lot of it's in your mind um, and you have to figure out what works well for your mind. So being a little bit self-aware. And for me, if I know I'm going to the gym and I'm not really feeling it, but I have to do five, six, seven exercises, I'm like, uh, do I really have to go? <laughs> I'll kind of convince myself I don't have to. But if I tell myself I only have two to do, it's a lot less, I guess, strenuous in my mind. Um, and so I'm more likely to go as well. And for me, another big thing was that if you think about you know, how muscles grow, right? You're like, you're tearing them down during the workout and they're recovering in your sleep. So for me, I was like this idea that, you know, you could do five or six, seven different exercises um, that, you know, somewhat tear them down, or you can focus on, again, two compounded lifts that are most effective and are really going to tear them down and perfect that. To me, it just, it just makes more sense to focus on those two. Um, so I know that was kind of a rant, but that's the reason why I only do those two exercises. Another thing that I quickly wanna talk about is the order I do it. Um, so I actually do my hip thrust first and then deadlifts. And I do do that. I do do that on purpose. Um, and the reasoning is I switched it up before just to see if it would actually make any difference. Um, but I noticed my quads would really burn on deadlifts. Um, and then by the time I got to my hip thrust, my quads were kind of on fire. So I'd also feel my quads when I was doing the hip thrust. 
but I noticed if I start with my hip thrust and then go to my deadlifts, I feel it less in my quads because they're not burning. And since we're talking about compounded lifts, which for me was super, super intimidating as a beginner, I do want to touch base on kind of how I got myself to actually do these in the gym, because to be quite honest with y'all, like it, it took me a long time. Um, I would go to the gym and I would always do a lot of cardio or I would do like maybe a few dumbbell workouts, maybe like the most obvious um, machines, but I never touched the barbell. And it was just something that was really intimidating for me um, because, you know, as I, I hate to say this, but people can be judgmental, right? I mean, you can see people looking at you and then like, if you're like me, you get really bad anxiety that people are staring at you and making fun of you or like judging you or even worse, someone comes up to you and like fixes you in front of everyone else. So I know this isn't necessarily the best advice to give in terms of kind of like an empowerment female standpoint, but this is like truly, honestly, the way that I did it. I have really bad anxiety when it comes to these things, um, like truly terrible. So what I actually did was, and this is gonna sound a little silly, but I actually went to a gym about an hour away. I think it was like two or three <laughs> towns away. Um, and this is gonna sound weird, but a lot of gyms have free trials. So they have like a three day pass or a one day pass. And it's pretty much just so you can see if you like working out at that gym. And I would do those at towns far away <laughs> um, where I knew I couldn't bump into anyone. And it was always like really late at night on the weeknights or weekends or really, really early in the morning when I knew not a lot of people would be there. And again, I know that's not the best advice because we should feel comfortable enough to go. But for those that are really struggling like I was, that is really how I did it. I went to a gym that was far away that I knew no one I knew would bump into me and I did their free trial. And then once I felt comfortable enough to work out in my own gym, in my hometown, that's when I started doing it. And I will say I do still work out only in the morning. It's just a preference of mine that not a lot of people are there because even to this day, sometimes I get anxiety. Um, but again, I know that's not the best advice, but just in case someone has high anxiety like me, that's exactly how I did it. Thank you all for watching. I really appreciate your guys' support. And I think for the next video, I'm going to go over nutrition because I think personally for me, this was one of the ones I struggle with the most, um, being a picky eater and being scared to gain weight. <laughs> it was just not a great combination. Um, so I'll definitely go over nutrition next. Um, but thank you all so much for watching and like and subscribe. Bye y'all.